Hello everyone and welcome back. In this video, I'll show you different logical vulnerabilities that we may encounter in near with some case studies. And then afterwards, again, I will jump into the code and show you some examples. So see you in the slide deck. All right, so let's begin. Logical vulnerabilities are the hardest to spot because it requires a solid understanding of the project, how it's built, what's its purpose, like you have to read documentation. You cannot just go like maybe sometimes you could, but in general, you cannot just go and read the code line by line and then understand, yo, there is like a logical vulnerability. Sometimes like logical vulnerability might occur if you chain a couple of functions together, like you call one function A and then you call function B and then afterwards it lets you call function C to exploit the contract. So you have to sometimes zoom out a bit and look at the contract as a whole to understand what are the possible pitfalls that might occur there. So, And for this, it's super nice to build a threat model, some attack scenarios that might happen even before reading the code, just only from the documentation and from understanding how it's built. Either from the documentation again, either from if you auditor, you're auditing a project and client sends you some diagrams, like from those, so it's super nice to have some attack scenarios to test the project. So for instance, like example scenario, it, what, what happens if the user uses the same account as sender and receiver during token transfer? So here's the case study, custom and EPU 101 token. So like we already have like pre-built token standard and near contract standards, but some projects like to use a custom build once or because like for instance, like near contract standards are not fit their business model. So they decide to just build a custom one, like by copying majority of the code from contract standards and adding a little tweaks here and there. So there was like a state of labs incident where a hacker managed to get the, managed to drain some funds from the contract. Like majority of people, at least from the security Twitter I read, didn't truly understand what happened and the majority of them were calling it a re-entrancy for some reason. Um, it's not, so <laughs> there is, if you, since repo is public, if you track their fixes, you can see that they fixed an issue during that time uh, to prevent sender and receiver being the same account. And it was the root cause of the exploit. It's, it wasn't a re-entrancy. <laughs> so if you go deeper and read about the code. So basically they have, they copied exactly like majority of the code is copied from the token standards, but they added tweaks here and there and they forgot to add one check. So there is FT transfer, just basic transfer. Then it calls internal FT transfer. Then we ensure that amount is not zero. And here sender, uh, sender is coming from predecessor account ID from the caller and receiver ID is passed by the user. So we're just getting account, ensuring that they exist, and then we ensure that the amount that user exact actually has the amount they're trying to withdraw. And then we just subtract amount from the sender and add that amount to receiver and then update account, just updating the storage, inserting new amounts to storage. So that's how it's supposed to work. Like Alice calls FT transfer with 60 tokens to Bob, then contract calls internal FT transfer from Alice to Bob, and 60 tokens. Alice shares get updated to 40, basically 100 minus 60. Bob shares get updated to 160, 100 plus, plus 60. Then there is like update accounts, basically we insert some data to a storage. Alice's balance gets updated to 40 tokens and Bob's balance gets updated to 160 tokens. All sounds good, but what if sender equals to receiver? In that scenario, imagine hacker called FT transfer with 60 tokens and put his own account as a receiver. So sender is coming from caller and receiver is user passed argument. So sender and receiver in this case are exactly the same. So internal FT transfer is from rogue to rogue and 60. So rogue shares sender are going to be 100 minus 60, 40. And the rogue shares receiver are going to be 100 plus 60, 160 tokens. Then we call the update account, first update account. So we update rogues, uh, rogues storage and we insert new data to a storage with uh, rogue share sender to 40. But then we call it again 
but with the rogue shares receiver since rogues key point to the same account in their storage Forty gonna get overwritten by the receiver shares, basically one sixty. So first update, Rogue's shares are forty, and the second update, Rogue shares now are one sixty tokens. So we basically updated it twice, and the last update was for a receiver. So basically three tokens for, for a hacker, sixty tokens were minted from the thin air. So that was the root cause exploit so they should have had a check that prevents this from happening by ensuring that sender does not equal to receiver and i'll show you this example in the code afterwards so there is also was another case study that i saw in during my audit so storage is not free so again but it's not related to the service so and it makes sense to take storage deposit. So many projects implement some storage depositing logic. And in the real world scenario, the project did not check whether the specified account was registered or not in the right place. So they did check it, but did not check in the right place. So it led to anyone overriding any user's data. All right, in this example, we have storage deposit function. And as the name suggests, it lets users deposit some near for their storage deposit. So there is account ID and registration only flag and users also use attached deposit and attached deposit to deposit some near. And the issue is that the function checks whether certain account IDs have registered or not inside of the registration only flag. It means that imagine if we put registration on the flag as false. In that sense, we won't be reaching here. We're actually going to go directly to internal register user and then just uh, register account or overwrite existing account with supplied amount. And also, as you can see, account ID can be anything. It's not coming from a call or it's not coming from env predecessor account ID. So malicious actor can just put any account ID, put any attached deposit amount and then just overwrite existing user. And usually it can be exploited in a way that we can put just super minuscule amount as attached deposit and then override someone's account ID with super low deposit. So imagine someone has like 10 year deposit, just imagine, and we decide to put 0, 0.0, I don't know, whatever amount of near as attached deposit and we managed to override 10 year account with 0 0.01 near so that's bad so that was the root cause in this scenario and as you can see malicious actor can just call storage deposit bob and put registration only flag as false and put attached deposit as one near and assume like his storage deposit before was 100 near and now because of this attack we register we registered bob or or written his account to make it one year so be after that bob's balance bob's storage deposit is one year now all right so that's it for the slide deck and i'll move to the code to show you some examples all right so welcome back to the code so in this example we're going to try and exploit logical bug in this contract again you have access to this code inside of the logical folder just clone the re repo and you have access to it so in this smart contract, we have deposit near, transfer near, withdraw near, the union deposit, and some internal functions such as decrease balance and internal transfer near. And the issue is that we do not check whether sender does not equal to receiver. So in transfer near, we just have sender through predecessor account ID, we have supplied receiver and amount. So well, then we go to internal transfer near, and here we first assert whether sender has enough money, then we get receiver deposit, and then afterwards we compute new deposits for both sender and receiver. We subtract amount from sender, then we add that amount to receiver, then we commit everything to a storage. So we commit a new deposit to sender, a new deposit to receiver. Imagine if we have if attacker has 100 tokens and attacker decided to transfer 20. So 
attacker has 100 tokens and decided to transfer 20. So in this scenario, sender and receiver are going to be exactly the same. So when we go to internal transfer near, we get balance. Yeah, we have enough money since we're only trying to transfer 20 near or 20 tokens. And then in receiver deposit again, same thing. We already registered. So receiver deposit is also 100 since sender and receiver are exactly the same. In new sender deposit, we first subtract 20 from existing deposit. So it's going to be 100 minus 20. So we have new sender deposit as 80. Then receiver deposit, we're going to have 100 plus 20, 120. And then we commit everything to storage. First, we commit sender with new sender deposit. So in here, attacker attacker has 80 but then we just committing another another deposit receivers deposit to the same account since sender and receiver are exactly the same and now attacker suddenly instead of having 100 has 120 so we literally just minted another 20 tokens so that's pretty much an attack so let me move to integration tests and show you the exploit so if we move to the exploit logical bug function. So here we just have prepare logical. It just deploys all the contracts that we need. Nothing too complex there. Then we have just, first of all, we need to deposit some near. So as a caller, we're depositing 14 near. Then we just asserting whether everything is correct. Then we are checking whether the balance of the caller is 40. In this scenario, caller is an attacker. So. So we have sender balance before transfer, which is 40. Then we deposit 20 near as a receiver. So in, in this scenario, attacker or caller has 40 near, receiver has 20 near. And then we also assert whether everything deposit was successful. We just print stuff out. Then we initiate like not malicious transfer to just see how it works. Like if, if everything is correct, if sender does not equal to receiver. So in this scenario, we just calling transfer near as attacker or as caller and then supplying receiver account as a receiver. And we're only transferring 20. So technically 40 minus 20, it's sender is going to have 20 tokens left. So we're just doing some assertions in here. Then we're checking balance of the receiver. The receiver should have 40 tokens since received before had 20, 20 plus 20, 40. And then just printing stuff out, checking balance of the attacker or caller. Now caller's balance should get decreased to 20, basically 40 minus 20 is 20. And then we're moving to actual exploit. In this scenario, attacker only has 20 tokens. So let's keep that in mind. And here we're calling transfer near again, but instead of supplying receiver ID, we're just supplying caller ID, just caller's account and we are trying to send 10 near so in this scenario we're just searching everything success and then we are viewing deposit of the caller and because of this issue we instead of having 10 near we're having actually 30 near those 10 near got added on top of 20 near so and here we're just printing everything out so let me run the code and show you how it looks in action. Okay, so logical contract is deployed. And we should, yeah, send the balance before transfer 40 near. Receive balance before transfer 20 near. After transfer, they should switch. So receive balance is 40 since we're transferring 20 near. And sender's balance before, tran after transfer is only 20. And now, we are using exactly the same account as sender and receiver. And then after this attack, we got 30 near back, which should not happen. So we managed to exploit this bug using integration tests. So let me actually try to fix, try and fix it to show you how we can simply avoid it. We could just do require actually just do this. I already have sender here, so require. Yeah, just simple as that. Let me just rebuild everything. 
and restart the restart the exploit. So we should get an error back. So logical contract is deployed. We are doing regular transfer, non malicious one. Everything should work. And now, as expected in executing exploit, we got an error back. Smart contract panic cannot transfer to yourself. So that's pretty much it. That's how you could protect yourself against it. All right, so that's it for this lecture and I see you in the next one.